The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Restaurants Canada webinar, Navigating COVID-19 Takeout and Delivery. My name is Roberto Sarju, Director of Marketing and Communications here at Restaurants Canada. Uh, we have some, uh, and, you know, an incredible uh, panel uh, put together today for you uh, to help answer the questions around navigating takeout and delivery across Canada. As you know, uh, these are these are unprecedented times in our industry and anything that we can do to help uh, really truly does help. So uh, we've put together some panelists uh, in hopes of helping answer some of the most pressing questions that you have in regards to takeout and delivery. Uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, first Oren Borovich, co-founder and COO of Kitchen Hub. Oren, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, please tell me a little about, about yourself and Kitchen Hub. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so my name is Oren Borovich and I am the COO and co-founder of Kitchen Hub. Uh, Kitchen Hub is a virtual food hall, uh, also sometimes referred to as a ghost, ghost kitchen. We provide dedicated turnkey kitchen spaces for restaurants to do off-premises, meaning takeout and delivery business. Uh, predominantly through apps, but other channels as well. Uh, we also act as a shared front of house and provide a suite of services so that the only thing that the restaurant partners that rent spaces from us need to do is bring their staff, their food, uh, and cook orders as they come in through the various channels. That's awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, next, we have Dominic Padula and Valley Akela of Canadian Food Safety Group. Dominic, Valley, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, a little bit about yourselves and a little bit about Canadian Food Safety Group. Um, my name is Dominic uh, Padula. I'm president of Canadian Food Safety Group. Um, we've been doing uh, food safety education since 2000. Um, operate where head office is in uh, Calgary, Alberta, and um, we have. Um, and nationally accredited uh, food certification or food handler course that's uh, approved across the country. As well, um, through our sister company, Safe Check Brand Protection, we do independent inspection and uh, audit and training, brand protection audits, we actually call them, um, to help um, food service operators up their game as, as far as food safety and quality in their, in their operation. Go ahead, Valley. All right. Uh, I'm Valley Akella, and I'm the director for food safety and quality with this uh, company. I've been here about seven years, but overall, I think I have more than 15 to 20 years of food safety experience across Canada and, and the rest of the world. Here, I'm involved, as Dominic said, in training, developing training that does online courses, as well as conducting audits that we develop uh, audit protocols for. And I'm happy to be with you today. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here. And last but not least, uh, Ryan Freeman, Head of Enterprise Partnerships at DoorDash. Ryan, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Roberto. Um, I am Ryan Freeman, as you just heard. I manage the Enterprise Partnerships team for DoorDash Canada. I've been with the company for just under a year uh, and previously was with Yelp. So I've been in the restaurant technology space for, for quite some time. Um, we work with hundreds of thousands of restaurants across North America, helping to connect them with millions of diners, serving tens of millions of meals each month. Um, you know us best for our marketplace, where we connect consumers to restaurants and couriers to allow them to get the food they want from their favorite restaurants, wherever they happen to be. Um, and we work with, I've had the privilege to work with many of the folks on the line today, and I'm excited to share some of what we've learned uh, through those partnerships with the rest of you. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Um, like I said, uh, really, really interesting webinar today for some uh, for some really great insights. One, uh, Kitchen Hub will be talking about how to operationalize your kitchen during COVID, uh, which, you know, has changed the way we really do things at the back of house. Um, Canadian Food Safety Group uh, will talk about some of the health and safety best practices, both kitchen and uh, and takeout. And finally, uh, talk to DoorDash will be informing us some keys to delivery success, um, you know, as dining rooms close across the country. Um, how can we leverage takeout and delivery? Uh, to succeed. So uh, with that said, Oren, uh, let's uh, hand it over to you. Thanks, Roberto. Um, so uh, in the current situation, a lot of restaurants have either brought on um, takeout and delivery or just dusting off their profiles with the various apps that they may be partnered with. Uh, and at Kitchen Hub, we've developed a playbook around being able to operate profitably 
on 100% takeout and delivery. Today, I'm going to share some of the learnings that we've picked up, as well as discuss a few things that we've implemented as a part of our uh, safety measures during this crisis. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how to approach your menu. I'll go over how to think about real estate in an e-commerce driven channel, uh, your relationship with the apps, um, and, and last, uh, some of the safety measures that we've taken um, in our facility. So starting off um, with our thoughts on menu, I'm going to break it up into two, uh, two different main considerations. Um, I can't actually see the slides for some reason. Oh, here we go. Um, have you ever tried, so the two, two different main considerations, you've got, we've got table stakes, and these are things that we would think about, you know, pre-COVID. And then the other, the other piece is, you know, what can you do um, in a COVID world during and post lockdown uh, to ensure you're, you're meeting the needs of the consumer? Um, so on, on kind of table stakes, uh, have you ever tried your food after it's been sitting in a package for 20 minutes? You know, a lot of restaurants that are switching to takeout and delivery have incredible have developed these incredible dishes that look amazing on the plate, but when it comes to takeout, that very same dish, which was designed to be eaten by consumers within five minutes, is now being shoved into a package, sitting on a shelf, and then lugged across town before it gets eaten. And you know, we built our business around this. We recognize this, this point, um, and we work very closely with the restaurant partners in our facilities to make sure that you know all the food that they make holds really well for delivery and you know, is presentable in the package. Um, so for example, you know, we noticed with one of our restaurant partners, uh, actually just recently, that they had a, a sandwich on their menu that was uh, consistently getting negative reviews, but in-house, when we would try, the, try that same sandwich, we thought it was amazing. We thought, every and everyone we tested on thought it was amazing. So we recreated the delivery environment. Um, we you know, packaged the food, we let it sit in a bag for a few minutes, then we, we lugged it in our car over to another location, pulled it out, um, and tested it. And we found the answer was simple. The coleslaw on the sandwich was making the bread soggy. You know, that's a simple, a simple thing that you probably wouldn't consider if we didn't do, if, we, if you didn't test your food um, and, and how it, how it uh, holds in the package. And, you know, with that kind of insight, uh, it's really driven uh, reviews within our facility to, to go up quite a bit because um, all the food uh, that's being prepared here has now been thought through um, as, as a product that is going to be delivered. Some other thoughts um, on menu, you know, thinking about the structure of your menu, you know, you, you often have your menu for dine-in as appetizers first, then your entrees, then your desserts. Does that make sense for your menu on delivery? knowing that uh, the consumer is uh, probably going to eat all of the food that they get at the same time, especially the appetizers. Does calling, it app calling the appetizers appetizers even make sense, or does it make more sense to refer to them as share plates or uh, something on the side? Um, consider offering drinks as options to every menu item you have rather than a standalone ca category, um, and then also offering drinks that somebody probably doesn't have in their fridge. So, you know, maybe it's not uh, the bottle of pop, but maybe it's the kombucha that they probably don't have at home. Um, and then just a couple other, the, the other part of many considerations, actually, the bro just go back, um, is, you know, in this COVID lockdown world, uh, we know we're headed into a recession, money's going to be tighter, groceries and household items are harder to get. Uh, consumer trust is is eroding around takeout and delivery, and um, you know some consumers are still still ordering, but other consumers are kind of scared. And I, I even heard of one story where um, someone was on a on a Zoom chat with their colleagues, and the delivery person came from one of the delivery apps, and that person got shamed uh, for ordering delivery. So trust is is an issue. Yet at the same time, a delivery of restaurant quality food is one of the the few escapes and few indulgences, indulgences that we still have. And so, you know, what, what does all of this mean in terms of, you know, what you can do today to, to be successful on takeout and delivery? So, you know, one, you could add essentials and grocery items, and we've seen some restaurants do that. We've done that ourselves. Uh, you could offer bundles or combos that provide 
uh, you know, a little bit more value to the consumer. And you should also make sure to have some over the top options so that can, the customers can treat themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, your real estate is not what corner you're on uh, or that beautiful room that you built, but it's what screens you're on and where you are on them. Uh, and I think that's a key, uh, key point to drive home with anyone that's moving to take it on delivery on apps. Um, the consumer is no longer gonna find you on the corner. They're gonna find you on uh, you know, one of these primary screens as I refer to them, the top, the top uh, logos that you see, DoorDash, Uber Eats, Skip, Fedora, Ritual. Um, or they're going to find you through a secondary screen that, that, you're, that uh, you need to think about being on, like an Instagram, a Facebook, Yelp, Google, TripAdvisor, you name it. Um, and so, you know, starting to think about your real estate in terms of your screens um, becomes a key to, key to success. Um, and there's a few things that I, I wanted to point out with, with um, this insight. Um, on the primary screen part, that is the, the apps where you can order from. Um, you know, we've taken the position of not trying to pick and choose which, which apps to be with. And the real reason is because it's hard to know what customers are on which platform. And, you know, we've seen some estimates from down south where up to 70% of the customer base on one app could be different than the next. Um, and on that point, within our facility, we've seen some of our brands do 70% of their business with one app while still being on all the other apps, while others have seen a more even split across all the apps. And so it's really hard to know um, which one to be with. So we just say be, be with all of them. And on top of that, they're all spending incredible amounts of money to acquire the customer, to drive the order, um, to, to give them new and unique offers. And they're all doing this at different times. And so if you're not partnered with one of them, you don't get to take advantage or benefit from some of that marketing spend that they're, they're doing on your behalf. Um, the other piece on, on primary screens or these ordering screens or apps is, uh, paid marketing opportunities. A lot of them are offering these these promotions that you can take part of, and 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 in a lot of the cases, it's it's very cheap from a customer acquisition perspective. And so if you look at uh, DoorDash's first uh, zero dollar delivery or first order free, um, in that promotion you pay uh, the cost of the delivery fee for the customer. So that might range from somewhere between two to five dollars, um, but that's your chance with a brand new customer to try your food and to get them to become a customer for the long term. Uh, in the world of, of paid marketing, this is, this is a no brainer. Um, and then on the secondary screens, those logos on the bottom, um, customers are skeptical and they often look to Yelp or Google for credibility and reviews. And even if you're operating takeout and delivery digitally, um, it makes sense to have profiles on these guys because people will look for reviews and they will look for the credibility. We even had in our, in our space when we first opened some customers calling um, and saying, you know, Pie Northern Thai Kitchen is one of the restaurants in our space and saying, is Pie really here in Etobicoke? And the answer yes, is yes, but their, their, uh, their Yelp profile wasn't, wasn't ready yet. And so, you know, they call. Um, and then on the other, on the other piece on, on secondary screens here is you know, the apps are noisy and it's important to find noisy, meaning that there's a lot of restaurants on all the different apps. And it's important to find ways to create awareness and to be able to talk directly to your customer. Um, we found that social media gives you a great tool. Um, so, you know, we put a lot of effort into our Instagram, um, our Instagram profile, doing different promotions and making sure that we're in, in tune with the customer um, in a more direct basis. And uh, we think that that's a key to success in the long term. So overall, you know, the main thing that I'm, I'm trying to stress with this slide is that restaurants that are now focusing on takeout and delivery and working with, these, with the apps uh, and, and on digital platforms, they need to start thinking more like e-commerce businesses and a lot less like retail businesses. There's a reason that companies like Amazon disrupted the retail market. It's because they imagined their business from the ground up. It didn't try to layer their model on existing operations. And to the extent that you can do that as a restaurateur right now, um, that is reimagining your operations to fit with delivery and takeout, the more successful you'll be in the long term. Uh, next slide, please. So the aggregators are not the enemy. Um, they're your business partner. And you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to imagine that sometimes when you hear of rates of 30%, but the truth is um, 
you know, these apps built their businesses, you know, the apps like DoorDash and Skip the Dishes, they've built their business models around customer demand that has been exploding. The customer has voted and they want delivery and, and now they're stuck at home. Um, and a lot of restaurants look at the 30% rate and think, hey, these apps are being exploitative. Uh, they're taking advantage. Um, but the fact is, delivery is really expensive. And when you think about all of the costs that go into this, this process, you think about the driver who spends 30 minutes delivering the food, his time, his gas, his insurance, the car payment, maintenance, and he has to get paid and make a profit. Um, plus, the app, which also needs to make money, is powering hundreds of thousands of restaurants, powering thousands of drivers to be able to make money through this channel, building state-of-the-art technology, employing armies of people to make sure there are enough drivers on the road, that the app is working, that the customers are satisfied, that the menus are being built quickly, and about a million other things that they're doing, you realize like, hey, this 30% this rate isn't so, um, isn't, isn't so much exploitation, but it's just a necessity. And so at Kitchen Up, you know, we realized that restaurants were going to be successful in this new channel, uh, were the ones who embraced it. They looked at the aggregators like partners and they completely reimagined their models, like to my point earlier. Um, they reimagined their models to be able to sell their food, um, incorporating the 30% cost and still being able to make a healthy profit. Um, and you know, from our perspective, when or on behalf of our partners, we, we go to extreme lengths to establish really strong relationships with the apps, however we can do that. Um, so whether it's you know, obsessing over customer ratings, reviews, and feedback to make sure that uh, the app, the customers that are ordering through uh, DoorDash are getting a good experience when they order from a kitchen hub restaurant, um, or focusing on the operational metrics to make sure the food is hot, that we're not missing items, that uh, the drivers aren't waiting too long. Um, or promoting our partners in all of our communications, making sure that we're telling everybody that, you know, hey, uh, DoorDash and Skip the Dishes exist, we are on them, um, and they're offering these great promotions to you. Uh, and then the last, treating, treating the drivers or, or the dashers well, you know, giving them a pleasant experience, because at the end of the day, they are uh, the person who is going to have the, the only phys physical interaction with your customer, although maybe not so much today. Um, so, you know, we've, we've done a lot to do our part and what we've seen, at least in, with COVID right now is the apps are doing their part. Um, so you know, DoorDash has offered 50% uh, off of the commission fee for the next month. That's a huge, huge amount that, that, uh, of savings that they're providing to the restaurants and it doesn't come without a cost to them. Uh, Skip the Dishes has provided a commission, commission rebate, Uber Eats, as uh, provided free delivery to customers of local restaurants. And so, so the apps are doing their part and it's incumbent upon us to be able to do our part um, to ensure that uh, we can all be successful in this revenue channel. Um, next slide, please. And so I'm gonna quickly just go over a couple of the safety measures that we've taken. You know, um, Canadian Food Safety Group is on this webinar, so who better than them? Uh, I'll just, quickly list off some of the stuff that we've done. So uh, in terms of, uh, you know, keeping distance, uh, we've actually, uh, we've cut off access to our building during operating hours. So nobody's allowed in that's not essential. So it, it's only, st only staff are allowed in. We don't even allow, uh, allow suppliers in. Um, we've redesigned the handoff process to the driver. We've kept six feet in between the driver and us. Um, we actually put a table right at the front of our door so drivers can't even really get in. Um, and, um, you know, that, that again, just reduces the amount of, of uh, interaction in the space. Uh, we've, we've provided a lot of education to our staff through meetings and communications, um, and we've even gone as far as um, uh, providing a written declaration to staff that they are going to, uh, that we are going to do whatever we can from a social distancing perspective in and outside of the facility, and that um, you know, they're committing to doing the same. And then on sanitary procedures, aside from the already stringent um, processes that we've taken um, pre-COVID, um, we've got on regular alarms uh, every 15 minutes to remind people to wash their hands or change their gloves 
um, and uh, wipe down different surfaces, you know, especially the high traffic ones like the front door handle. And so that's some of the stuff we've done. We've also done, um, we're also constantly adapting. Um, but as I said, who better than to talk about uh, the food safety than the Canadian Food Safety Group who's coming up next. That's great. Thanks so much, Oren. Um, no, that, that was great. We do have some questions and we will get to questions at the end of the webinar. If you do have any, feel, feel, uh, feel free uh, to type them in the box. Should be, I believe, at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Uh, moving forward, Dominic and, uh, Dominic and Valley of Canadian Food Safety Group. Guys, uh, let's, uh, let's talk some health and safety in these, uh, in these unprecedented times that we're in today. Uh, thank you, Roberto and Oren. I'm going to kick this off. So, Oren, you gave good insights into the operation aspects. Let's do the food and health and safety. What is known about COVID is changing on a daily basis, both in Canada and the world. So our content today is based on the latest guidelines from global uh, sources such as the WHO and then national sources like Health Canada and other key Canadian US agencies. Uh, how does COVID-19 impact food? Simply put, Coronaviruses cannot multiply in food. They need an animal or a human host to multiply. So if you happen to ingest the virus through your food, it is killed by your stomach acids. So to, as on date or currently, it is believed that it is highly unlikely that people can contract COVID-19 from food or food packaging. Should that change, our government agencies will take steps to provide our food and the people. Uh, it is important for you to maintain trust and customer confidence and to ensure that food is safe. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So what do we know about COVID so far? One, the virus is a respiratory virus. It uh, basically, you expel the virus if you're infected in your uh, respiratory secretions. Uh, as you breathe, as you cough, as you sneeze, stuff comes out of your nose and mouth and as droplets. These could be floating in the air for a time and the heavier droplets would fall around on the surfaces around the person who has just coughed them out. So that's how the virus comes out from an infected person. The other people who are uninfected, they could breathe them in, or they could touch contaminated surfaces with their hand or shake hands with somebody who's had an infection. And then if they touch their eyes and nose or mouth, then that's how they're exposing themselves. Who are the people who are shedding these virus? Obviously the infected people as well as it's been shown now that uh, after infection, some people take some time to develop symptoms, right? So even before they exhibit symptoms, they're shedding the virus. Some people are exposed, but they don't seem to fall sick. They're asymptomatic, they're also shedding the virus. So this is how it comes into space around you. How long does it take for the symptoms to show? It's apparently taking anywhere between two to 14 days right now. And how do you know you have the infection? Well, the obvious symptoms, uh, there are pretty tight guidelines or uh, rules on who's being tested currently, but unless you get tested by a, a specific or special laboratory, uh, you don't know whether you're positive or not. Now, who is at risk? Everyone is at risk. What are the symptoms? Cough, any kind of cough, even if it's dry cough, uh, fever, anything that's above 38 Celsius and more. Shortness of breath or breathing difficulties, fatigue, a loss of sense of smell or taste. So keeping all of this in mind, and since you don't know who's expelling the virus, you should be careful. Can I have the, if you have any symptoms, you should go to the doctor. We'll talk more about it later. Yeah, coming to the survival on surfaces. A lot has been said about it. Uh, coming to how long does the virus survive on food, even though it doesn't transmit through food, it can survive on food. So apparently these are the studies which came with the older SARS and the MERS uh, coronaviruses. Uh, this virus is extremely stable at frozen temperatures for more than up to two hours at minus 20. The MERS virus has been shown to survive for about 72 hours, that is three days at four Celsius or in your refrigeration temperatures. If you look at these uh, graphic next to it, you see a whole bunch of uh, uh, timelines that are given for the survival rate. You can see that if it's a, a dry or a um, porous object like paper or tissue paper or cardboard, it is a shorter survival. It's about three hours on paper and up to a day on cardboard. 
if you look at surfaces that you would probably use in the kitchen like stainless steel and um, plastic in which you cook and store food it's two to three days these surfaces are smooth and outside of a surgical mask it's been shown to be viable for more than seven days surgical mask you would probably wear in a hospital setting there's a lot of exposure yes it is contaminated any mask for that yeah. matter so then what we were going to talk about is how about money as such money doesn't uh, transmit anything but it's a surface paper or coin and so it could be contaminated and therefore people should be careful hand sanitized hand wash etc so these are all the survivals we talked about how about sunlight people say there are rumors that uh, sunlight kills the corona no it doesn't the ultraviolet in the sunlight is not strong enough to kill so if you say you ex you expose things to sunlight and so you should be okay you're not how can you kill this virus uh, for all its ability to survive at different temperatures etc it can be killed by heat cooking at 70 degrees celsius and above kills the virus common disinfectant chemicals are also able to kill the virus health canada has a web page on the approved uh, disinfectant chemicals with a din number that are approved for use in canada a chemical that you all know chlorine that is bleach works at a thousand ppm the normal chlorine that you use the bleach for sanitizing is 100 ppm this is 10 times stronger the quartz that you would use is 200 ppm the disinfecting is about 600 to 800 ppm that is four times the strength so you could figure out what you need to use depending on what you're working with but this is how you could kill the virus thorough hand washing when you wash your hands the soap makes things slip off your hands and just the soap and warm water will be able to wash a whole lot of stuff off your hands that's the reason why frequent hand washing is also being recommended um, can we go on to the next slide please Dominic, that's now your turn. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Valerie. Um, I think as far as uh, food safety management, um, restaurants, in a sense, as much as all this is new and it's um, <clears throat> it's a challenge, it's it's also easier for restaurants to adapt because they they do a lot of these things already. Um, restaurants understand uh, personal hygiene. Restaurants understand uh, proper cleaning and sanitizing of their facility. Restaurants understand, um, <coughs> excuse me, restaurants understand the um, um, the things that people need to do to keep food safe. So what they need to do now is strengthen those uh, food safety and hygiene practices. Um, increase cleaning and disinfection um, de designate somebody that's not only um, a person that's going to liaise with public health uh, but also designate a food safety leader in the facility uh, this is a concept we've talked about for a long time about having somebody um, that's actually in charge of food safety it's often the manager but now more than ever you need to have somebody that's really watching all these things on a consistent basis so um, uh, to keep COVID out of your business. You want, you want to protect your staff, protect exposure to the infection, the transmission and the virus of the virus. So um, ch changing um, in small ways, things that were already happening uh, can help protect the business. Next slide, please. So how do we prevent exposure and transmission? Um, exclude staff that are sick. So. You might want to consider am i going to check their temperature we have we know of some facilities that are doing that they check the temperature of the employee when they come to work if they have a, a slightly elevated uh, temperature they're excluded um <clears throat> check um ask them to self-declare as well right are they feeling ill this is a challenge uh sometimes because some people they have to go to work because they got to pay the rent they have to go to work because they need food. <clears throat> so now having, um, you know, the the government, uh, like uh, Roberto um, discussed last week, has has come up with some uh, programs to help in this case, so that we don't have uh, sick people coming to work, and that's really really important. Um, instruct the staff to self monitor, you know, uh, the respiratory etiquette and training. The sneeze sneeze into your sleeve. Um, wash your hands after. 
frequent cleaning and disinfection, frequent thorough hand washing. I, I like what Oren said about, uh, you know, having a, uh, an alarm go off for every 15 minutes that, you know, regardless of what's happening, everybody's going to stop and wash their hands. That's, uh, that's awesome. Excluding non-essential staffs, um, Oren also spoke to, um, is, is important. And uh, again, um, in, in our training for sure, but most training would speak to that about excluding people from the kitchen. Salespeople, um, you know, service people, anybody that's uh, non-essential to the process uh, shouldn't be there. Um, the distancing, physical distancing, uh, it can happen in some kitchens. In some kitchens, it's going to be a challenge. So now we might have to stagger our production to allow for that. So um, thinking about how you can do that in your kitchen is important and um, it, it, to, to maintain the, um, the distance, you know, having an A team and a B team that, that are working on, at different times, that can, uh, that can help. But it's, it's possible because, um, again, most restaurants can adapt and are used to adapting to, to difficult situations. Um, do you have adequate uh, personal protective equipment? So uh, are you going to wear masks? Are, is public health recommending masks in your environment? It's probably not so far in most places. Um, they might rec be recommending it for going out in public. Um, but in kitchens, they haven't uh, come out with anything definitive as far as um, working with um, masks anyway to while you're preparing food. And that's possibly uh, more, well, most likely because um, it's not been shown to be transmitted through food. So the the risk of infection of the food is is very low. Now, as far as gloves and hand washing, again, these are things that were happening all the time. Now it's just heightened awareness and heightened enforcement of, of those rules. So do you have enough gloves on hand? Uh, are, are the hand washing stations uh, free and clear? You know, is there paper towel and soap? Th those are things that, uh, that you need to have. Next slide, please. So we've talked about uh, some of the personal hygiene uh, things that happen. Um, do you provide refresher training? How about uh, hygiene practices? Um, a few weeks ago, we we put out a, a free personal hygiene uh, refresher with uh, Restaurants Canada that's available on our site. So if uh, if they're not going to do the full food safety certification, refreshing them with a 10-minute course on personal hygiene is probably a good idea. Um, again, the reinforcement. Is everything covered up in your in the kitchen? We have the covered bins at the hand washing station. Uh, it's something because we see this often in in restaurants that are really tight, where there's um, containers of food that are close to hand wash stations because the kitchens are tight, and those are uncovered, you know, leading to splashing and and stuff into the food. So it's a, it's a general food safety concern, even more than as much as it is a a COVID concern. Um, the no bare hand contact. Uh, we talk about that in our, we're talking about the finished food. We're not talking about food prep here. We're talking once the food is, is completed and, and finished. So the, um, you know, are you using tongs, gloves? Is that person dedicated to, to doing that? This is important. Um, we've also developed a, um, a, a, a course um, specific to uh, delivery drivers. Um, and um, we'll have more on that with Restaurants Canada on doing a, a two-for-one uh, here in the coming days. Next slide, please. If if you are using masks, they got to be used properly. Um, gloves, again, the uh, hygiene refresher, we talk about that and proper glove use and trying not to contaminate your hands washing after the the use of the gloves, washing after uh, removing your mask. So um, the mask is, is a good idea, but it's it's got to be used properly or else you're going to be contaminating yourself and or others by use of it. Um, it should fit snugly. Uh, and if you're using cloth masks uh, and somebody's making them for you or you're making them yourself, make a lot of them so that you can wash them frequently so that you after after any sort of contamination or just even using it for, for an hour, you could uh, throw it in the laundry and wash it on hot. 
um, and uh, you'll, you'll clean it effectively. Next slide, please. So best practices. Um, yeah, clean, separate, cook, and chill. Imported foods are safe to use. Again, um, like we had said, um, the, the, the virus doesn't survive for a long time on, on packages. So anything that's imported has been in transit for weeks and probably months in, in many cases. Um, it's, it's not gonna be contaminated from its source. Uh, if, and if anywhere it's gonna get contaminated, it's gonna get contaminated at the grocer or at the wholesaler. Um, but now even very less likely at those places because everybody, including the grocers, including the, um, the wholesalers specifically, are taking very stringent precautions. So they're, they're well aware of what's happening. They have very stringent controls in place. So our food, surface, our food source and sources are very safe. The, the consideration would be fresh produce that was maybe touched or handled, um, you have to wash it or soak it in cold water um, and just plain water, don't use detergent. Um, if you're using a, um, a produce specific wash, uh, like paracetic acid from uh, Ecolab or Diversity has another one, I think it's called um, Eden, maybe it's called. But anyway, they're very specific to um, washing uh, produce and um, if, if you have those, that's great, continue to use them. If you don't have those, uh, don't try doing it with bleach or soap or anything like that because it's very likely that you're gonna contaminate the, the produce and do more damage than good. Um, cook foods thoroughly. Again, these practices and these guidelines um, or regulations actually in, in most cases are in place already by um, uh, different food regulators across the country. So the the provincial health departments and the rules you're following already as far as cooking and cooling still apply, right? Um, avoid menu items that have uh, raw, rough, raw or undercooked meat. I don't think many of those things are getting delivered. I hope not, but next slide, please. So cleaning and sanitation, disinfection. Valley spoke about this earlier. Um, the disinfection with the chlorine at 1,000 parts per million or quats at 800 to 1,000 parts per million, um, that is disinfecting. If you're doing that on a food contact surface, like utensils, tongs, and you're disinfecting them, you have to rinse, after you let that air dry, you rinse that away and apply sa the sanitizer at your normal levels. There's two separate things here. Um, the disinfection is to kill that viruses or the virus that may be um, there and it's 99.9% effective. Um, but you don't wanna leave that disinfectant on the food contact surface, right? So you can disinfect the food contact surface with the extra strong um, sanitizer, but then you, um, then you rinse that away after it's air dried and apply the normal 200 ppm quat or the 100 ppm uh, chlorine or the 12 and a half uh, ppm uh, iodine. Um, you know, clean soiled surfaces first, right? It's, 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 it's scrape away, wash, rinse, sanitize, air dry. Um, choose the right product. Um, contact your supplier if, 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 you, if you have one that supplies you with chemicals and they'll give good, uh, good guidance on what to use. And if you can't get some of the sanitizers you're normally using, uh, chlorine at 100 parts per million for sanitizing, and like we said, 1,000 parts per million for disinfection. And remember that they're different. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, Oren spoke to this, I think, as far as uh, the consumers being um, trusting the delivery. Um, what can you do to, to make sure that you're delivering it safe and you're delivering it to instill trust with that consumer? Um, the, the delivery driver, um, I, I think um, Orion will speak to this as far as uh, what, they're, what they're doing for the drivers. Um, but 
Um, do you have a station where the delivery driver uh, can pick up the food? Is it separated from the kitchen? Uh, Oren spoke to this earlier. Um, do they, can you have supplies for them there that they need to um, clean and sanitize their bag? Is the surface clean and sanitized or disinfected? Can the driver use the facility to wash their hands? And then as far as your packaging goes, seal it. Make it tamper evident. Uh, you know, put a label on. Uh, tell the consumer what you've done, right? So if we go to the next slide. Um, tell them everything you've done. A lot of people don't know that um, restaurants, they understand the food's really good, but they don't necessarily know everything that goes into making the food safe. And restaurants work really hard uh, to do that. I think it's important to, to tell the customer, here's everything I've done to keep you safe. Now, if you're not doing everything you can to keep the customer safe, this you may not want to tell them, but you may also want to reconsider what you're doing. Are you communicating with your staff food safety on a daily basis. You know, this, this whole crisis has heightened everything around this, um, which may be a good thing that came out of it. All, you know, we're all gonna be washing our hands better. Most of us are gonna stop shaking hands. So if we tell the customer, um, here's all the things we've done, and we go the next step of, again, this is something that's been talked about in food safety certification for a long time is, um, are you giving the customer the instructions on how to handle the food safely after they get it home? Refrigerate it within, you know, within an hour of receiving it. Reheat it within, um, you know, to 165, 74 Celsius before consuming it or, or, or the next day. Clean the outside of the, the packages, right? Um, and this might be stapled to the outside of the bag or it might be taped onto the outside of the bag. It may be, uh, in the future, I see it as being printed right on your delivery bags, right on your paper bags or your plastic bags. Um, consider double bagging your product. So double bagging would be, um, you have your, your paper or your plastic bag or your containers, then um, they're into a bag and then they're into a second bag so that the consumer um, knows, hey, my packaging that's in my home didn't touch the delivery bag because I can throw away this outer bag and this inner one is from is from the restaurant without it having contacted or being potential contact. So uh, consumers are starting to take precautions. I think uh, reinforcing with them the same message that they're getting from everywhere else uh, sends a good message that the restaurant cares. Next slide, please. And then reopening. Um, if you've been closed and you're now transitioning to delivery or takeout or or whatever you may be doing, or maybe you're you're only doing a takeout for the takeout on the 15th, um, what do you need to do before you open? And there's a lot to be done. Um, reorient your staff. Talk to your staff about um, the measures that you're putting in place. B before you do it, actually, think them all out. De determine, I, I, and I like what Oren said earlier, is look at your whole operation from scratch, from the ground up, as if you'd never done this before and you're only gonna be doing uh, delivery or you're only gonna be doing takeout. Um, so now, what do my staff need to do? Uh, train them on what you've put in place. So if there's personal protective equipment that they're gonna be using, if there's physical distancing that you've put in place because you have a, an A shift and a B shift or an A side and a B side, or um, you know, this is prepared in the back and this is prepared in the front, whatever it might be that you've put in place, you have to uh, take the time to, to train them. Um, clean and disinfect and then sanitize every surface in your, in your kitchen, everything. Top to bottom, you should do it. Um, it's gonna not only be a, a good practice for your kitchen, but it's also gonna instill confidence in your staff that you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, check your equipment, your, all your temperatures, obviously. Uh, check all the, all the food that you had in storage. 
Um, check for spoilage, best before dates that need to be dis discarded. And the old adage of when in doubt, throw it out, uh, definitely applies here. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what if, um, what if somebody in your restaurant is sick with COVID or suspected of being sick? Um, no, notify the health unit. Very likely they know already, maybe before you do. Uh, but if, if the person, it's, it's quite possible that the person wasn't tested and j just has all the symptoms of it, you still notify the health unit or the local public health authority. And they're gonna tell you what to do. They're gonna tell you to quarantine the staff, they're gonna tell you to shut down, they're gonna tell you to, whatever it needs to be that ha to happen, uh, they will tell you to happen. And they wanna know. Uh, you're not gonna be bothering them or putting them out because they have other things. Um, uh, uh, environmental health, as much as they are part of the health departments in most provinces, um, they also are there as their primary um, function is to work with restaurants and seniors care and uh, food service operators to ensure the public health is protected. So they want to know if, if you suspect something or if, if an employee is sick, um, they're going to work with you to, 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 to do it. And they know that most restaurants have a, a very good working relationship with their departments. Uh, they're going to help you and they're going to help you get through it. Um, and they'll, they'll work to trace contacts, you know, to isolate people that need to be isolated and uh, and help you get get reopened if you need if you're closed um, keep all the staff informed i think this is really important to let everybody know what's happening and uh, the precautions you have in place um, you know if you're following these precautions already public health is going to say you're doing everything right you're doing all these things um, they're going to ask probably that you clean and disinfect the whole facility again and uh, make sure that anybody who is uh, who's ill or showing any signs of illness stay home and then um, discard any food that's open uh, or prepared or ready to eat food uh, into the garbage and then you're gonna start again. Next slide, please. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doc Nix. Thank you so much, Valley, for that insight. I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about the kitchen. We talked a little about the health and safety. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the take on delivery side of that and how we can, you know, leverage, uh, as Oren put it, the real estate, the digital screen real estate that we have. Uh, Ryan, over to you at DoorDash. Thanks, Roberta. Um, so we're firm believers that consumers are increasingly demanding pickup and delivery so they can enjoy high quality food in a more flexible way. As you all know, this has never been more important um, than it is in this current crazy climate. Um, so in the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to share a brief summary of how DoorDash is helping restaurants ensure three things. One, that delivery and takeout can be done safely. Two, that it can be done profitably. And three, that there are really, really simple ways to get started and generate meaningful sales no matter what sort of restaurant you run or what your experience is like with, with digital channels. Next slide, please. We know, especially with experts like Restaurants Canada and, and Canadian Food Safety Group and, and, and Kitchen Hub on this panel, that, that you guys have health and safety covered in the restaurant. After all, you know, restaurants are the trusted provider of food to millions of Canadians as much now as, as ever. Um, you have access to resources. The government's been helpful um, as a regulatory industry and, and, and training groups of, of all stripes. What we've invested in is making sure that the independent couriers we work with have access to the education, the technological enablement, and physical equipment to extend your world-class investments in health and safety from your front door to your customers. Specifically, there are four areas where we've a ton of focus, particularly of late. The first is around best practices and, and guidelines. We are regularly sharing, hosting um, the guidance, regulations, and best practices from global and regional food and health safety authorities, the WHO, CDC, Health Canada, uh, CFIA, and provincial and, and, and state level bodies. They're available on our website and are regularly sent to our community by email. 
we may not be health and safety authorities, um, but we're investing in making sure that the dashers in our network, the independent couriers, have access to those who are. The second is contactless delivery. Um, we've changed the default settings, as have, have many of our peers in, in the space, um, such that all deliveries, unless, unless explicitly specified or requested, are contactless. Uh, payment happens automatically in the app, so no contact is necessary there. Um, customers can give specific instructions to, to the courier about where to leave the food. Otherwise, the, the courier will leave it outside the front door and send a message or, or phone call as notification. The intent here is to make sure that even through delivery, um, we're supporting social distancing while enabling access to critical and hopefully delicious food. Um, the third area here in, is in app instructions. Given the amount of engagement our dashers, our couriers have with our app, we've turned it into a powerful communication tool as it relates to health and safety. At the delivery level, customers, dashers, restaurants can communicate effectively about how to best pick up and drop off food to limit interaction. And at a macro level, uh, DoorDash can use it to disseminate the types of best practices that, that we just went over. Uh, lastly, but certainly uh, not, not least, is around safety equipment. DoorDash is making available for free to all of our dashers um, over 1 million sets of wipes, hand sanitizers, and latex gloves, and over 2 million face masks. They can easily order it at no charge through our, um, our Dasher web store, and it'll be delivered to them promptly. The idea is uh, to do our part to ensure dashers have access to the equipment that they need to perform their job safely at no cost to them. Next slide, please. We know that while safety is everyone's primary concern, uh, delivery needs to be as profitable as possible for restaurants during this, this crazy time. Um, to achieve this, we've rolled out um, a series of measures that have two aims. The first is provide financial assistance, make sure that restaurants and their employees can be profitable. And then second is to maximize the potential sales that come through this channel by boosting demand. Um, we'll start, start with the first, financial assistance. A couple of things I wanna highlight. First, um, DoorDash is providing all new local restaurants with 0% commission for their first 30 days. And beyond that 30 days, we'll reduce commission by 50% indefinitely. Similarly, uh, pickup orders will be charged at 0% commission for the indefinite future. Um, and all local business will be included in Dash Pass, which if you haven't heard of it, is DoorDash's um, premium monthly subscription program, uh, providing customers with $0 delivery, similar to, to Amazon Prime, but specifically for restaurants. Um, we'll help uh, provide payments to our partners on a daily rather than a weekly basis to help with cash flow. And lastly, we know many restaurant workers find themselves with fewer hours at the moment. So we've created a priority program to help your employees sign up as dashers, enabling them to hopefully meet their financial needs until their jobs, uh, their day jobs return to normal. Uh, we know, you know making ends meet is uh, more difficult now than, than ever. And so allowing them to supplement that as a dasher, uh, we hope could make all the difference um, and, and ideally take some of the pressure off of you as well. Um, moving on to the second uh, column here, um, the aim is to help increase sales volumes. We're arming all new local partners with $200 in marketing credits. Um, we're providing assets like web links and email templates and downloadable signage to make sure that traffic to your website or uh, you know, foot traffic on the street um, and your email audience know that you are available for, for delivery. And then lastly, we've spearheaded a global campaign called um, open for delivery. Hopefully you've, you've seen it. Um, we've invested in primetime TV spots, online media buys, social media campaigns to highlight the importance of delivery in the survival of, of, of our industry. Um, we're investing heavily here and have, have already seen a, a big surge in, in demand on behalf of our restaurant partners. And we're also using this as our platform to support related initiatives like Canada Takeout um, and among others. Next slide, please. I know delivery can sound daunting at first glance, and, and, and given the amount of time we have remaining, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to skip through the slide quite quickly. Um, but what I want to get across here is, if you remember one thing, it's that we make it very, very simple. You don't need to have a graphic designer or a web developer or you know, an engineer on staff. Everything you need, you already have. 
And there are some really, really simple tools and, and tips and tricks that we make available for you during the onboarding process to make sure that things like your menus are set up nicely. You're using concise and, and punchy descriptions. Your photos are representing your food properly. You are um, thinking about your menu structure in an intelligent way. You're making sure to, to include add-ons and beverages and, and alcohol in ways that, that will help you boost or, or optimize your, your sales. So um, I'll skip through this, but, but know that these resources are available um, for you um, for free online. Next slide, please. So I know I've, I've thrown a fair bit at you here and, and I've, I've tried to do so in, in, in a tight timeline, um, but there's only really one point that matters. Um, third party delivery is a simple and safe way to get your food into the hands of your customers now more than ever. Um, with the significant investments that we and, and our peers and competitors are, are making, um, in ensuring it's profitable, it can be a really, really powerful and, and helpful channel during this difficult time. And I encourage all of you who may not have explored in the past to give it some real, um, some real time and, and thought. Um, check out our blog to learn more about how we think uh, about delivering effectively and, and how you can do so, particularly during, during this COVID crisis. And then uh, secondly, check out get.doordash.com to have your restaurant um, up and live generating incremental sales um, by, frankly, tomorrow. Um, thanks. Appreciate the time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I think that was some great information overall. Just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll quickly hop into the Q&A. I know there's a lot of questions that have come through and feel free to, you know, continue sending your questions uh, through uh, through Restaurants Canada across all our social channels. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get these out to the partners to help, you know, answer. Uh, we will also be, re this webinar is being recorded and will be shared as soon available so you can uh, you can go through it again. Uh, but, a, but a couple of questions that I think that are interesting that, you know, I'd love to take some time to answer today. Um, Oren and uh, Dominic, you guys can maybe help with this one, but uh, are, do you have any specific details on how you've created distance in the kitchen? Um, Oren, maybe more for you um, in terms of how maybe some of your kitchens uh, have done this. Uh, yeah, happy to answer. Um, so we're actually in the process of uh, putting down tape on the floor uh, to help our staff know what six feet look, looks like at all times. And so that way that, you know, as much as possible, um, they're they're keeping their distance. Now, you know, it, it, I think a lot of people will agree with this, you know, in a kitchen, it's it's difficult to do it 100% of the time. Um, but as long as we're mindful and we're doing it as much as possible, that's that's kind of been the um, direction that we've we've gone. And we're, we've also, um, made available masks for anybody who, who wants them. And we're not, we're not making them mandatory um, because of, you know, the um, questionability uh, of, you know, proper mask, wearing masks properly and all that, but uh, they are available. And that also um, is, is being used as a way to, to help with the uh, social distancing measures. Anything you'd like to add to that, Dominic? No, I, I like the idea of the tape. Um, yeah, it's it's hard in, in 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 lots of kitchens. I agree with Oren 100%. And unless you have a big kitchen with where you can set up uh, multiple stations where people, you know, normally would work, um, we like the idea of, of separation by time, where where people are working at different times if possible, because then you you're limiting the the amount of people that are in the kitchen. So in the, in smaller kitchens trying to limit it to one person, right? Trying to let where, where one person was doing multiple things. Now you might have uh, people dedicated to doing certain things, right? Somebody could be working on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the uh, packaging and, and getting it ready for the delivery driver, because uh, that's going to be an important part. So as far as the kitchen goes, um, the space is going to determine what you're able to do and uh, rethinking how your process works um, might be a way to go. If, if, if you have no space to keep distance. If you have long kind of workstations, you can have staff not facing each other, which means you work on this end and the other person works on the opposite side. That also kind of helps in a certain way to uh, add to this physical distancing, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Any recommendations on glove use? Yes or no? I know, Dominic, you touched on it, or Valley, I believe it was you, um, on, you know, in food prep, um, you know, consistently washing hands is important, but, you know, always on, always off, replace every time. Any thoughts and recommendations on if an operator does decide to go the glove route? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grab this one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Public health uh, has never recommended gloves in food preparation. Gloves become important in the finished, ready-to-eat product uh, and or tongs. And the reason is, is um, people would not be changing their gloves as often as they needed. Um, study after study says that people are often wearing gloves to protect themselves versus protecting the food. So the goal here is to protect the food from contamination. So, um, and a anybody who's ever worn gloves I really understands this pretty, pretty easily. You don't feel when your hands are soiled when you're wearing gloves, right? You're especially not gonna feel a virus or a germ. So the hand washing becomes super important. Um, so in the prep side, when it's raw and you're prepping it before cooking, um, no gloves. If it's ready to eat, so if you were preparing a salad, romaine lettuce, and you're chopping that, it's not going to get heated. It's not going to get any any sort of uh, um, any other process after you're handling it. Now gloves are important in that case, right? Well, if you're plate, if you're packaging it or putting it into a package, gloves or tongs are important. And I would suggest tongs versus gloves, right? Some sort of utensil because again, the gloves aren't going to be changed as often as they should it's it's challenging to do it uh that's awesome thank you so much um ryan and oren for you guys uh any best practices you can share on the handoff between the restaurant and the delivery driver uh yeah so you know what we did was we we actually spaced we created a makeshift counter, which we brought right to the front of our space. Um, and then we put a couple of tables in between that counter and the closest that we could get to it. So there is always a minimum of, of six feet um, in between our staff and the drivers that are coming to pick up the food. And when we hand off the food, when we drop the food, we drop the food in a middle counter um, that's in between um, where the, the closest that the driver can get and us so that we're never reaching over and, and getting very close to, to, the, to the driver. There's always going to be uh, at least a few feet in between. That's awesome. Uh, our, uh, our training depicts that as well with, um, with some short little videos and, and, and photographs of, of keeping that distance. And I, I like what Oren has done in that they have a, a station set up that's easy for the driver to understand of here's how it's going to work and um in in your case um the you you guys are controlling that pickup because you're you know your kitchen hub right you can do it um for restaurants that aren't operating out of a space like that um they can right now especially they can in most cases very easily set that up in their own restaurants because in I, I think nowhere in Canada do we have sit down available right now. So setting up uh, a station like that with distance um, should be easy, could be easily done because you have no dine-in ha happening right now. No, that's great. Um, I had a question in regards to to menu items, which I thought was interesting. Um, but you know, I think Oren, you touched on it. And, um, you know, Ryan, one, your, your last slide touched on consistency, um, but, you know, being able to, I, I'm not just putting menu items on that I'd regularly put on, on my delivery menu. I can, I can modify my delivery menu. Is that like from a DoorDash perspective, Ryan, um, I don't have to necessarily offer everything that I'm offering in my restaurant at, for dine-in, for takeout and delivery. Is that correct? I think Ryan may have had to drop off because I know he had another uh, important engagement. But um, I can give you, I can give you the perspective of Kitchen Hub, and we work very closely with DoorDash. Um, 
And I can tell you that they al DoorDash allows you to set your own menu. And so you can do whatever, whatever you want on the menu side on DoorDash. You can go in and program it yourself. You can change items on the spot and they're live within seconds. And, and because you can work I add to that? Sorry, go on. If I can add to that, restaurants could also consider uh, providing a combination meals or partially cooked meals in the sense. Uh, they can provide uh, meal kits, which uh, the customer can heat up to a certain temperature. Even if it's something like soups, you can say, okay, reheat your soup to this much temperature. So that even if there's been any scope of contamination, it will get cooked off when the customer is reheating it. So that way, those kind of instructions will also make it uh, helpful. Meal kits, kids' meals, stuff that can be assembled easily, stuff like that can also be done. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Um, and, and I think, Oren, one of the questions I had for you was, because you guys work with these, you know, the third party so quickly, um, really, it's all about doing the math on the food products that you're adding to that menu to really make it work in order to be successful um, versus having sort of, you know, losing money items on that takeout delivery menu. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a combination. So, so the fact of the matter is you need to be very, very um, careful about what you are putting on your menu and the purpose of what you're putting on the menu. You know, it could be something that is a lower profit item, um, you, you probably don't want to do it at a loss, but if it's driving customers to order and then you can make money on add-ons, that is a strategy you can take. Um, what, we, what we coach our partners on is being super streamlined and finding the menu items that, that where there is profit margin, whether it's from a preparation standpoint, so a labor standpoint, and you, know, you need to be very careful about, about your labor, um, when doing delivery and takeout, um, or or from a you know product co cost standpoint, you know uh, one of our partners is a barbecue restaurant. And the cost of barbecue is is expensive, um, but then they get to the benefit from low labor. So they look for lower labor types of um, types of of items so that they can they can make the profit um, even with that thirty percent cost. Awesome. Um, listen, guys, there's there's a few more questions, but I know that we're uh, we're past our hour here. Um, I just want to thank everybody for sticking around. Uh, this record, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be shared. Again, if you do have any more questions, we'll definitely get those over to you. I want to thank our panelists uh, for taking the time out today to speak with us and sharing their knowledge and their experience. Um, and again, uh, as these questions come in, we'll do our best to get them off to our panelists who are happy to answer some of these uh, that are available. Uh, in the meantime, if you, uh, if you are looking for more information, uh, check out the Navigating Coronavirus Restaurants Canada page. That's restaurantscanada.org uh, slash COVID-19. You'll find the most up-to-date resources there from uh, partners as well as public health resources. Uh, you'll also find our Restaurants Canada Federal and Provincial Relief Measures Handbook. Uh, this handbook is uh, is, pop is updated almost daily uh, with any new updates coming down from federal or provincial uh, governments in terms of relief for the food service industry. So uh, please uh, don't forget to check that out. And finally, um, in preparation uh, for takeout day, I uh, hope you learned uh, some uh, takeaways that you can implement into your business if you are doing uh, takeaway or delivery uh, right now. But uh, starting Wednesday, April 15th, it's Canada Takeout or Takeout Day. And each and every Wednesday following that, it's a, it's a call to the nation to uh, order takeout, uh, sit down with uh, family uh, inside your home so you are staying safe and enjoy a meal and your favorite meal from your favorite restaurant who may be offering uh, takeout and delivery. So please, this Wednesday, uh, promote that. You can visit canadatakeout.com. Uh, you can get all the assets there. You also, if your restaurant is not on the restaurant finder, uh, please go in and submit that. Uh, and once again, we are promoting uh, kicking off uh, Wednesday, April 15th, each and every Wednesday, Restaurant Takeout Day, uh, Takeout Day Canada. Uh, and uh, as a special surprise on April 15th, uh, the Great Canadian Kitchen Party uh, will be doing a live stream on Facebook kicking off at 8 p.m. Uh, so once again, that is uh, Takeout Day, April 15th. I want to thank, once again, our panelists. And I want to thank you, uh, each and every one of you who took the time out today to tune in. And hopefully uh, we left you with some takeaways uh, that you can implement in your business to help you navigate these unprecedented times that we are in today. Uh, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.